President Mohamed Bouhari plans to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. And beneficiaries of trader money reluctant to pay or repay the loans. This is Plus Politics and I am Osao Gye Ogbonwa. President Mohamed Buhari has inaugurated the National Steering Committee to oversee Nigeria's Agenda 2050. Part of the task before the group is to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty within the next 10 years. The team will be jointly chaired by Mr. Tedo Peterside and the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed. While asking members not to lose sight of Nigeria's global role, President Buhari said the success of plans must be designed to sustain national development, support regional and global strategic interest also. Joining us to discuss this is Bolan Leo Lubani, a lawyer and a public affairs analyst, and uh, Ose Aneni, um, also a public affairs analyst and uh, a hotelier. Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. I'm going to kick off with um, Osea Neni. Um, I'll start by going back to where we're coming from. We've had many other visions and development plans. You know, if you remember back then, Vision 2000, Vision 2010, Vision 2020, which, you know, is about being pushed away. And now this. Would you say any of it has been successful? Or, you know, is it part of every new administration to set up their own development agenda? Um, so I'm glad to be here, and um, that's a really interesting question. What what I will say is that every government must have a roadmap that um, it, it 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 charts its path along that it it sort of uses to try to achieve development and progress. Um, and so when you talk about the previous vision 2020 and and and, and similar programs, what they sort of did was take a stock of Nigeria's situation as it was back then and say, you know what, in 10 years, in 20 years, this is where we want to be. So, so the, the idea of you know, the president launching this is, is commendable. I especially like that it wasn't short term. It's from 2020 to um, 2050, I think. Um, the problem I do have is that it's, it's, it doesn't appear to be anchored in reality. You know, so taking a stock of where we are right now, uh, when he says he wants to lift 100 million people out of poverty, um, it's at a rate of almost 10 million a year. Um, that hasn't happened in the last decade, um, and I don't see how the president um, intends to achieve it in the next 10. Okay. Um, hopefully, Mr. Lugbani would um, be able to clarify um, or share ideas on how this might be possible. So, of course, Balan Leo Lugbani, I want to bring you in here. Um, if you can, to the best of your abilities, help us with clear details, um, if possible, on how the government may be planning to achieve this and lift 100 million people out of poverty. Well, there's no how you can solve the problem of taking people out of poverty without first um, laying the proper foundation. The infrastructure in Nigeria, basically the issue of electricity that drives industry and ensures that production is maximized and services are provided at a reduced cost or at the barest minimum must first be addressed. The fact that government has set out or is initiating a program to take 100 million people out of poverty is an admission of the fact that there's a problem. We have a huge number of unemployed youth, and the only way to solve or to defuse the ticking time bomb that that could generate is what the government is trying to do. So in doing so, there are different models. You can do it by microcredit, uh, as in the, the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh, which we tried to copy uh, by establishing the People's Bank in the uh, years past. Or we could do it by generally funding social and uh, engineering infrastructure, roads, bridges, low-cost housing, and all manner of construction to li liquidate the economy and to try to ensure that by that means many people are brought on board and employed, you know, into and, and made, you know, gainfully employed. 
But I think by far the best is to provide microcredit through a system that ensures that those who are beneficiaries pay back and in turn allow others to take benefit of that microcredit system. Okay, and I would like you to go on, you know, and of course, before we go back to uh, Mr. Neni, Mr. Lugbani, I want you to go on and um, do you think that we currently are um, uh, making those investments in the right sectors and pulling some of those strings that you've mentioned that will make this achievable? No, we're not. We're in a situation where it appears that we are putting the cart before the horse. You first lay the foundation before you can erect pillars. The foundation is to ensure that if there are 24 hours in a day, you have at least 16 to 18 hours of electric supply. This in turn ensures that money that would have gone into buying generators, fueling the generators, maintaining them, and in, in short, raising the cost of production or services is minimized. Thereby, the credit that is being provided will not be frittered away on sustaining the day-to-day -day running of the business because the vital factor of establishing the business is already guaranteed. So, but if we haven't gotten that right, how can we ensure that industry, either by that of production of goods or services, can move smoothly? In Nigeria, generally, it's known that if you don't have a generator, you can't successfully run a business. Okay, let's quickly go back to Mr. Aneni now. I also want you to speak on that. Um, how would you rate... Um, the performance with regards investment in the right sectors and making the right moves um, by the current administration that would make this likely, you know, in the next couple of years. If you, of course, you, they've also done, you know, their bit with regards investment in um, agriculture. Um, the, the government has also spoken about infrastructure that they've also uh, made some investment in. Um, but there's a, a little bit more that I believe that we might still be lacking, and I, maybe you, you would uh, speak on those things. Science and technology, um, I believe, is one of them. So how would you rate their performance that you know, would maybe like make this possible? Um, so when I spoke earlier, I talked about anchoring any plans in reality. Yeah. I, don't want to re I don't want to rate them because... Um, it, it won't be productive. You know, they aren't doing any, anything that I, I can say I'm going to rate. So when I talk about where we are right now, for instance, in 2014, our GDP was growing at a rate of 6.3%. It was above inflation. It was above the population growth rate, growth rate which is always around 2%, 3%. Today, it's, it's decreasing or shrinking at a rate of 6.1%. So it's, it's gone back almost twice. So our economy is sinking. Um, 10, 10 million people are no longer seeking jobs. They're out of the labor force. Unemployment is 27.1%. Um, and I could go on and on and on with these statistics that just sort of like tell us that things are dire. And what we should be talking about at this point, to my mind, is how do we stop the bleeding? And, you know, it was interesting that so we, we now have the, I think it's the National Steering Committee that is supposed to midwife and create this, this development plan. And we're coming from the Economic Council, Economic Management Team, then there's the Economic Advisory Council, then there's the Economic Sustainability Committee, and we now have this new steering committee. And it seems this is sort of like indicative of, you know, your house is on fire and you're just pressing all the buttons and you're hoping that one of them puts it out. You know, we are in a recession and, and you know, I, I, I seldom give this government credit. Um, but one thing that they did do was that they recognized that because of COVID, we needed an economic plan to sort of just keep it ticked and ticking, to keep money flowing into people's jobs. And that economic plan allowed for the creation of the, this 774,000 jobs that they were supposed to create, 1,000 jobs in each local government area, and it was manual it was low, it was below the minimum wage. I think it was 20,000 yeah. naira yeah. each person would be getting. The plan was, was supposed to um, last for a year. But what that sort of allowed the government to do was with 2.3 trillion naira, they would let people just keep their heads above water whilst this storm is raging. My problem is that we, we because we, we are not grounding uh, uh, plans in reality, 
it's why the president will talk about um, creating 10 million jobs. We cannot create 10 million jobs. We, we lose almost, I had the figures down, I think between 20, 2018 and now, we've lost 40 million jobs. So how do you, how do you suddenly just, not just stop the bleeding, so you create the, the 40 million you've lost, and then start creating 10 million uh, jobs annually? The president made an interesting comment. He said he would, it's possible, he believes it's possible because China has done it. Um, and that's an interesting thing. So what did China do? Um, in 1959, there was the Great China Famine. And what caused that famine was China's push to agriculture and they closed their borders. So they shut out the world, the world stopped trading with the rest of the world and felt that agriculture will save China. It led to a famine that killed about 39 million people, not 3,900, 39 million people from starvation. Closed borders and an insistence on subsistence farming, which is exactly what we are doing now. That's why food inflation is double digits. That's why we are seeing, and interestingly enough, China also suffered natural disasters at the time. So when you see that the rice farmers are saying that flooding has wiped out almost 12 to, uh, met, um, million tons of rice, you know, it almost seems like we, history is replaying itself here. But then how did China get out of, of uh, poverty? How did they manage to lift 850 million people out of poverty in 40 years? They opened their borders. They traded with the world. They liberalized the economy. The government got out of running got out of the way of private sector business. That was what they did. So we have the African Free Trade Connecta Agreement we haven't signed, even though we, we championed it. We are not trading with our neighbors. How are, how are businesses supposed to grow? For the first time, I think, in, since 1999, we currently have a trade deficit. So if we are not handling this, this basic issue, these basic structural issues that are necessary for growth, for prosperity, it doesn't matter how many committees you put together. It doesn't matter how stellar the, the capabilities of the members of those committees are. So, for instance, the chairman of this um, steering committee, um, Atet, um, Peter, he's an amazing, amazing man, a very, very smart, astute businessman. But if the government gets in the way of their plans and their programs, we will continue to get deeper and deeper into poverty. Um, just before I stop, so for instance, the government says they are uh, lifting their ending subsidy. And, I, and I, I supported it just because I knew that I know we cannot afford it, right? But then the GMD of NMPC comes on television yesterday to say that although we are lifting um, subsidy, importers are, are unable to import because a window, an FX window has not been created that will allow them to get the FX they need to import. So on the one hand, you're doing the right things, but there are institutional and structural things that stop these policies from bearing the fruits that, again, will lift us out of poverty. So you, you asked me to read them, and like I said, I don't want to because I don't think I can give them anything above zero. All right. Um, that sounds a little harsh. Bolanle uh, Lugwane, let's go back to you now. Um, and one of the reasons I started the conversation by speaking about um, every government seeming to have its own developmental agenda. Um, and, and so, you know, we've gone through waves of them, um, but we can't necessarily say that you know, any of them has been particularly successful um, um, because we've eventually got to the year 2000. We've got into 2020 now. Um, I, I want to I know what you think that the current administration may have in mind. Um, um, and um, because I'm going to factor in, of course, the low employment rates that we currently have um, in the country. I'm also going to uh, factor in um, um, a couple of other things, you know, low job creation also that, um, you know, currently we're dealing with. So do you think that the government knows these, you know, factors and understands what, you know, might make it extremely difficult to achieve these goals? Or you know, made, are they, is it possible that they have some other plan that we're, we're not aware of? I think that the uh, government has all of the necessary data, all of the information that is required for economic planning, fiscal management, 
and that which will ensure fiscal policies are already and properly generated. Government has a lot of resources to ensure that whatever it wants to do is achievable. But the truth is that Nigeria is a poor country living rich. Until we face the reality and address the truth that the way and manner we are running the economy of the country can never be to the benefit of the masses of the people. We are a monocrop economy. We depend mainly on oil exports. Oil, instead of being a blessing, has become a cause. It is what has made us neglect agriculture, manufacturing, and other sectors that can generate forex and employment. We're just finding it easy. We simply export crude oil and then take, it, take the dollars and then use it for whatever priorities that are determined by people who are not in direct link with what the masses are going through. So the idea is that until we de-emphasize the resources or the revenue from petroleum or crude oil and begin to say that, okay, for instance, let's give notice. Two, two, two years from now, we may deliberately shut down crude oil production so that we can go back to agriculture. Not just agriculture for the sake of producing raw materials, but agriculture that leads to manufacturing so that we can produce cocoa and not just export cocoa beans to Europe and America. We are already having the plants that are required to make chocolate and other products that come from cocoa, including soap and other things that are useful or beneficial from cocoa. So we need to take a decision, a political, social, and economic, de economic decision, the decision that serious countries take that makes them look inward, that disciplines their leaders from buying gifts of 50, 80 million and buying gifts of commissioners, ministers, and then squandering resources of the people on the severity of government. We need to redirect our priorities and invest more in infrastructure like power production and ensure that we are not spending all the money we are earning in servicing debt. We should stop borrowing money and ensure that we are generating money and spending what we earn. All that is required in Nigeria is discipline and truthfulness. That is sincerity on the part of the leadership to live within its means and to redirect yeah. and prioritize the welfare of the people and invest in human resource development, provide basic infrastructure so that the energy of the people can be harnessed for production. And, and if we're not doing this, does this make these plans and these statements simply, you know, like wishful thinking? If we're not exactly. making these steps exactly. like, like you've described. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Everything we're doing is pure hypocrisy. If we are serious and we get serious, within a period of five to ten years, if we behave like a serious country with disciplined leadership, when we are not pretending to be rich while we are poor, we will get to where other countries we are using as reference today are. Then I'm going to ask you know, a similar question to Ose Aneni, because I, I feel um, when these statements are made, you know, there is something that you know, is some, somewhere behind you know, these statements. So it's, um, and that's, I remember I started by saying that every government has its own development agenda, and you, you know, agreed with it. Um, that it's good that a government has a plan um, or has an agenda for development. Um, but what is there to trust about these plans? And of course, I'm, I'm looking also back at the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, um, looking also at, I mean, there's a lot of details, looking also at um, our current you know, debt profile. Um, it, it, uh, the uh, uh, Debt Management Office released some details a few days ago that were a little staggering. So when you put all of these together and look at how much our income is as a country also, um, how does this all make sense? Um, so trust and goodwill, I think, are necessary um, capital for leadership. Uh, when Buhari came in, and President Buhari came in 2015, um, I think he came in on a wave of goodwill and trust I haven't seen any world leader enjoy. Um, I think if he had put his mind to it at the time, all these hard decisions he needs to take now and push through now 
yeah. to put out on a path for prosperity. He could have pushed them through then. Um, fast forward five years on from 2015, and that trust I don't think is is there. Um, I, I think Nigerians are seeing the lives that government officials and their children and wives are living and are listening to the demands and sacrifices for sacrifice that government is asking them to make. And because of that dis dissonance, um, you know, you are getting pushback um, from the government. So, for instance, you know, and just to talk about this dissonance, for instance, um, recently the government suspended import licenses for maize. Expectedly, the prices of grains shot through the roofs. And then months later, the government then assigns licenses to about just four importers um, to bring in grains for the entire nation. Um, you know, so the government seems to have created a, an opportunity, created a scarcity, and we now have select individuals profiting from the suffering of the average Nigerian. Uh, so, so, so it's 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 difficult. I, I feel for the president. Um, we were hit with a with the COVID nineteen shock. Even yeah. before COVID nineteen, oil prices were already going down. So we were dealing with that. Um, almost all government revenues come from from oil receipts. You know, so they had they 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 were, they were struggling, and and I don't know. I, I really don't know how the government is going to push through this tough reform because they need to be tough if we are to dig ourselves out of this hole. And I'm not talking about prosperity now. I'm just talking about just lifting people, not even out of poverty, but out of penury almost. So when we talk about our social safety nets and microcredits, these things will not don't bring prosperity. They, they, they just keep you afloat. Uh, you need more you know, structural... Um, interventions almost to transition from poverty to prosperity. Um, interestingly enough, you know, when we're talking about development plans, the National Steering Committee hasn't actually put out a plan that we can look at and critique or applaud. Um, it's still just a committee to come together. We know we need a plan, so you guys should come together and, and um, come up with something that will help us. What I would advise our committee is that any plan they come up needs to be anchored in the reality of the fact that for every one naira that Nigeria generates, 99 Kobo is spent paying debt. That is a, a hard pill to, uh, pill to swallow. Um, but I'll, uh, oh, Luke Barney, I'm going to you know, quickly go back to you before we wrap up this, um, this part of the discussion this evening. Um, what would your advice be to uh, Ted Peter's side? Um, at this moment? Uh, my advice, <laughs> my advice is simply that um, the way Nigeria is now, with uh, the recent increase in the price or tariffs of uh, petrol and uh, electricity, there's a disconnect between the led and those who are leading, the governed and those who are governors those who are ruling Nigeria and the masses. So when there's a disconnect, when it appears that you are disconnecting with them, and at the same time, you are also seeking to do something for their benefit, there's no trust. We must go back to reorientating the people, to re-educating the people. The people must trust the authorities or the government before any policy that is being formulated now can be implemented successfully. If not, anything that they do, especially when it comes to providing any form of credit or benefit, the average Nigerian will just take it as their own fair share of the national cake. They will not cooperate fully, and the, and the, and, and the policy will probably be dead on arrival. All right, it's a uh, it's a uh, you know a lot of work for uh, uh, Matedo Peter side and of course uh, the Minister for, for Finance. Um, we look forward to you know the details of uh, this uh, 
plan to, of course, leave Nigerians, 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. And hopefully, um, we see some positivity out of it. Uh, thank you very much, Bolanle Olubani, and of course, uh, Ose Aneni. We are, of course, uh, moving on to the next segment in a bit. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, trader money participants refuse to pay back loans. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.